Good afternoon and welcome to our regular council meeting of Monday, March 13th, 2023. I'll call the meeting to order at 5 p.m. First item on the agenda, 1.1 land acknowledgement. The town of Coldell acknowledges that we are gathered on the lands of the Blackfoot peoples of the Canadian Plains and pays respect to the Blackfoot peoples past, present and future while recognizing their cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. The town of Coldell is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, region number three. Moving on to agenda item 1.2, conflict of interest declaration, pecuniary and non-pecuniary. Are there any in the room this afternoon? None declared, thank you. Moving on to agenda item 2.1 acceptance of the agenda. Are there any additions to the agenda this afternoon? Seeing none, could I get someone to make a motion to adopt the agenda for March 13th, 2023, as presented? Councillor Reese, any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item 3.1, adoption of the previous minutes from our regular council meeting minutes of February 27th, 2023. Were there any errors or omissions in the meeting? Councillor Chapman. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just for reference, um, throughout the meet, throughout the minutes, uh, we have uh, Councillor Jason Beekman uh, recorded as councillor and um, uh, council, or Deputy Mayor Beekman uh, or um, Pickering recorded as Deputy Mayor. And I, just since after the uh, swearing in ceremony, it should be reversed. So that carries throughout the whole agenda. Okay, thank you. Good catch. Any other errors or omissions? Um, seeing, seeing none, uh, can I get someone to make a motion that council adopt the regular council meeting minutes from February 27th as amended? Councilor Chapman, any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Mr. Mills, if you want to take your seat, we're going to jump down to agenda item 6.1. You know, take your time settling or settling in or just a little bit early <coughs> so the public hearing uh, will be regarding the intermunicipal development plan bylaw 861-p-01-23 and i'll call the just before i call the public uh, hearing uh, uh, to order I just want to mention to our viewers at home that uh, you'll notice that we are in a new location. We are tempor temporarily located in our upstairs boardroom of the new Civic Square town office. We will be here approximately uh, for five meetings while we're waiting for our council chambers uh, to be uh, finished, including the audio video. So I'll call the public hearing to order at 5.04 p.m. Again, regarding agenda item 6.1, Intermunicipal Development Plan Bylaw 861-P-01-23, to consider input on the bylaw I just mentioned regarding the Town of Coldell and Lethbridge County Intermunicipal Development Plan. And this afternoon, we have our Director of Growth and Investment, Cameron Mills, presenting. Cameron, the floor is yours. Thank you much, uh, very much, Mayor Van Ryn. So uh, we're here today to hold a public hearing for Bylaw 861-P-0123, which is the intermunicipal development plan uh, between the town of Coldale and Lethbridge County. Uh, we've passed uh, first reading of the bylaw. The public hearing provides uh, for members of the public to provide uh, their thoughts uh, with respect to uh, the proposal. We have had uh, public engagement on this previously, uh, which was reasonably well attended, though largely by uh, county ratepayers uh, and generally by people uh, interested in um, uh, learning more about the topic rather than, uh, rather than necessarily bringing up any concerns. 
Um, the bylaw was passed uh, by Lethbridge County previously following a public hearing held there and uh, passed with the amendments shown uh, in the bylaw report. Uh, we've had the uh, matter posted uh, online uh, for uh, your collection of information and we haven't received any uh, comments through that medium. Cameron, just before you continue, are you here for the interviews of IDP? Thank you. So. Yeah. Okay. Just listening. Okay. Well, you got here just in time. <coughs> We're just starting. So I'm just going to go over. I just get you to sign in. <coughs> so we're just in a process of uh, discussing uh, intermunicipal development plan bylaw 861-P-0-23. And uh, just for public record, I'll state that my name is Mayor Jack Van Ryan, and I will be chairing this public hearing. All questions and comments shall be directed through myself. Addressed to the chair will be Mayor Van Ryan. And the purpose of this public hearing is to consider input on bylaw 861-P-01-23 regarding the Town of Coaldale and Lethbridge County Intermunicipal Development Plan. And the public hearing procedures will be as follows. Council is here to listen to the information presented and make a decision on the matter that is the subject of this hearing. This is a formal hearing and this is not a debate. Everyone wishing to speak who has pre-registered will be given an opportunity to speak once to the matter as called upon by myself as chair. Each presenter must state his or her full name their address and their interest in this matter, including whether they are in support or not support. Individuals who do not identify themselves will not be given the opportunity to speak. Presenters are to stay within the suggested five minute time limit on the presentation and are encouraged when speaking to keep the presentation to the point and refrain from restating points raised by previous speakers if possible. If new presentation material are provided, you may be required to email a copy to the municipal clerk. So Cameron, I'll let you uh, continue on now, please, uh, and introduce the subject matter one more time. Appreciate that. Uh, so with respect to this particular uh, document, what the Intermunicipal Development Plan fundamentally is, uh, as we discussed prior to first reading, is uh, above all else a guidebook for how the municipalities uh, through their respective planning processes will engage and interact with each other, providing certain guidance with respect to what will be uh, feasible uh, in areas that are adjacent to those boundaries, just to ensure that the town's growth and any development in the county is compatible uh, across uh, those, those borders. Uh, it also provides guidance for how I would interact with my uh, peers in the planning department at Lethbridge County, the amount of time we should give each other notice to comment and, and, and where we would circulate and things like that. Uh, so fundamentally speaking, this document is very similar uh, to the previous plan, which was adopted in 2010. The fundamental difference is that uh, the borders are uh, expanded, which is reflective, uh, which is really reflective of the annexation that occurred uh, back in 2018. So fundamentally, what we have is we have a one mile uh, radius from the town uh, within the county, which is within that, that plan area. And um, as discussed, not fundamentally any changes uh, to the plan since the last time we reviewed the council with the note that uh, we did get some feedback from the NRCB with respect to clarifying some of the language within the document as it relates to how confined feeding operations will be dealt with. And so we've provided uh, for that amendment uh, to be shown here and we would encourage uh, that to be passed as per uh, what the county had passed previously. So if you could, for our guests, maybe just explain uh, what the IDP plan is uh, going towards the north. You guys live north of Oval, correct? So kind of explain to where the, what the boundary and stuff is. Okay. Uh, so basically the plan area, let's see if I have it uh, here. The document itself uh, is shown here. And just scroll down to show the map. And 
while you're looking for that camera, if you could just explain how the public hearing was advertised, please. Sure. So the public hearing uh, was advertised in the Sunny South News, I believe. Uh, Haley did the advertisement. So um, just in line with the town's uh, advertising bylaw. So uh, we would have taken out uh, a separate, um, separate advertisement relative to the county because we held them. Uh, on different days and just to be sure that we understood where the meetings was taking place um, let's see as well as posted we on our website and correspondence we did not so we didn't receive any correspondence with respect to that we also didn't receive any commentary through the town's let's connect page sorry it's a big document uh, so we haven't received it we did receive uh, like I say some feedback that was incorporated in the document based on that uh, based on that hearing or that public engagement session that was held back in November. Uh, so this shows the IDP boundary. So the town of Coldale boundaries are shown here. So this would be the lagoon, for example, this uh, black line would be the uh, Highway 845. So it extends uh, two quarter sections basically out uh, from each uh, from each boundary of the town. Uh, so anything in the orange uh, lined area would be within the IDP boundary. The previous IDP boundary um, would have been, you know, largely um, similar uh, in some of these areas, and a lot of the extension would have been uh, out to the west, uh, showing within the, uh, uh, let's see here, this is presidential R1A. Yeah, so the new boundary would be reflected here uh, with the orange relative to, uh, I believe, the yellow showing the previous boundary. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Henry, Maxine, you guys have any questions? No, we're just within that boundary, so just to give the information. Yeah. So, okay. so no questions regarding being in the boundary? Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'll open it up to council then. Does anybody have any questions for Cameron? Just maybe Mayor, just make a comment that uh, this is a uh, uh, Plan that the county has already um, made approval of. And is that, is that correct? Yeah. So how these documents work is both uh, both municipalities need to approve it in order for it to be sort of given the, the life of a of a fully completed document. Um, there are two ways of doing that. We can have a joint public hearing uh, together, but the logistics of doing that are very difficult um, and given that we don't anticipate usually uh, a substantial amount of engagement at this level uh, we feel that the easier thing to do is to simply do them staggered this way so may I just uh, uh, mention too i think my thoughts are that if the county has already sort of given their their uh, blessing towards the, the incoming for, for us as a collaborative unit to uh, to also and I think just reading through through the document uh, cam that I I see that um, for example the big one would be the NRCD which would include the intensive livestock component and how that's addressed and, and how that's being worked and dealt with mm -hmm. so um, I, I don't see any trouble for myself in approving the document no. Deputy Mayor Beekman uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, if we can, uh, just can you kind of just uh, refresh everybody on kind of what the reception was at the open house? Um, what, what the majority of the people that showed up, whether they were uh, county residents or town residents, and kind of what their overall thoughts were following the presentation. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so definitely, the majority of, of folks showing up would have been county residents, and that's that's reasonable because it has, uh, while it doesn't have a tremendous amount of impact on the day-to-day -day life of a county resident. It certainly has more impact on a county resident than it does uh, within the town. So uh, definitely some questions uh, from county residents about how it might affect them. And for most county residents, at least those that I spoke to uh, when when discussing it, um, you know, not necessarily a significant impact uh, relative to plans that might be had. The folks who might find something like this uh, restrictive relative to their desires might be someone who was previously not in the plan area, who's now in the plan area, who wants to take sort of an undeveloped uh, quarter section and install a large scale cattle operation there, for example, or something like that it becomes far more difficult to establish a new uh, feedlot, for example, within one of these areas. Uh, but for them, given that you know we didn't speak to anyone that had plans of that nature, um, 
know, there was not really uh, sort of any significant pushback with respect to uh, those types of specifics. No, Sorry, I, I sort of mumble. Um, yeah, so largely, uh, we didn't. I didn't find, at least in my interactions, um, that there was any sort of significant um, disagreement with the content of the plan. The, the majority of people that came were sort of curious. They understood that they might be impacted about it. They wanted to learn about it. Um, I'm going to stop kicking things with my boot. And then uh, largely, so largely the feedback that's incorporated in this document was reflective of that. I've used Cameron's example several times. I'm speaking with the residents about put, putting a nuclear power plant on the fringe yeah. of Coldale in the county. It would be nice that the town of Coldale would know something like that was happening. So, yeah. So that works well. Okay, any other questions? Just one other quick question about the, the, uh, uh, the town boundary versus the fringe boundary. Uh, the, the county was is still uh, to the point that it'd be sort of an undeveloped land in the meantime, or is there... No, uh, part of what the uh, plan does is allow for the county uh, to potentially develop that land. What it ensures, though, is that the develop we have the ability to comment and provide guidance, um, and and any development that occurs in the county should be sort of conducive with what the town's plans are for growth. So, for example, uh, if the town's plan call for an area to be developed, uh, say commercially along Highway Three, if that land were to be developed in the county, it would have to sort of mirror that. There might be. Uh, requirements that that development look uh, more urban sort of in nature and, and sort of flow uh, sort of direct so we want to latch match landscaping standards for example or things like that thank you yeah. okay last chance for questions does council have sufficient sufficient information to make a decision on the intermunicipal development plan bylaw 861-p-01 dash two three thank you i hereby declare the public hearing regarding the idb plan that i just mentioned closed at 5 17 p.m and we'll speak further to that further down the on the agenda under 7.1 so you're welcome to stay we'll be doing that for about 10 minutes if you want to stay for that Okay, moving uh, back to business arising from the minutes. Agenda item 4.1, Animal Wellness Committee. We have uh, our manager of community policing, Mark Anderson, presenting. Mark, when you're settled in, the floor is yours. And we're having some audio uh, issues to make sure that you really speak up so that uh, we can pick that up in the live stream, please. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. Uh, I'm here this evening to speak about our Animal Wellness Committee, which has been an ad hoc committee. Uh, Council requested that we engage in in early 2022 uh, when we found we did not have an animal facility contract anymore with our outsource contract provider. Uh, the committee has been meeting on a, a fairly regular basis uh, looking at different plans and looking at ways to develop a Maiden Coaldale solution for animal control, animal wellness. Um, and uh, we've reached out to a number of community partners around us in other jurisdictions and other municipalities, and also other societies and, and uh, <coughs> humane groups and gathered a fair amount of information to move forward with. At this point, though, our Animal Wellness Committee is an ad hoc committee. It's not an official committee of town council, which has uh, now brought us to the point where it limits our ability to share the information we have gathered with members of that committee because it's not a sanctioned committee of council. And I'm here tonight to uh, ask council to consider making the Animal Wellness Committee a council approved and sanctioned committee of the town. Uh, the purpose for that would be that we can then invite the community members who have joined us and who are partnering with us to, to move forward. We can invite them to be members of that official committee. Uh, we can then engage them in confidentiality agreements, which will allow us to then share uh, the information that has been gathered 
so that they may use that in moving forward to uh, develop and build an animal wellness uh, society here in Coaldale and help us move forward with our plans in addressing uh, animal control and, and uh, humane issues uh, within the town. So I'm here <clears throat> today to present that to you and to seek uh, direction from council and if uh, council so uh, considers to, to make that uh, motion to make it an official committee of council so that we can proceed forward. Um, the, uh, the major considerations of course is that we can't share information we gather in an official capacity with anyone who is not in an official capacity with the town. Uh, it would not stop us in our work if we can't do that. It would just uh, lengthen out the process quite a bit because we'd have to have our committee members then doing all of the research on their own from public source documents uh, and starting from ground zero. So by being able to share the information from other locations, it will greatly reduce the amount of time and effort that's going to go into uh, to building this. Uh, the other benefit to this is that this would be the first uh, official step, if you will, in council turning this over to a citizen committee so that it is actually a citizen and a community driven program and not one that's being driven by the administration or by municipal enforcement. Uh, so that it would, we separate those two uh, processes, one being an enforcement component, one being an animal wellness component and have each focus on their, on their best tasks. Um, as far as financial impact, at this point, there would be no financial impact uh, on the town in sanctioning a committee. It would, however, give the committee an opportunity uh, to prepare budgets and to submit requests for budgeting in future should that be necessary. And it would be something then that our finance department could have oversight over um, and input into. Um, so far in our process, we've had uh, several community engagement meetings. We had one in, in October, we had another one in February, and we've had some by invitation meetings as well with members of the community who are supportive of forming an official committee and moving forward and, and taking on the challenge of the work that's going to go into this. Um, for, uh, it'd be my recommendation, of course, that, that council approve uh, the Animal Wellness Committee as an official committee of council. Um, council may also choose not to do that. Um, they can ask us to continue as an ad hoc committee in our work uh, or, of course, you could count the table this discussion until a later date when we've had an opportunity to to have more input as you wish. Okay, thank you, Mark. Tim, can I just get you to come up here and, and adjust the microphone? Lan is having a hard time hearing us. If you could maybe raise it on top of the, uh, the phone the conference call. There we go. Okay, yeah. perfect. And then Lana just mentioned too, with the laptop covers up, that it's a block. You don't have to put them down. It's just that when you when you want to talk, uh, make sure that you either talk loud or you can put your screen down if you want. So thank you, Mark. And I just wanted to echo a couple of his comments. I wanted to uh, send out my appreciation to the mayor of Tabor and uh, MD Reeve. We reached out to him and within 24 hours, we had all the documentation that we needed from uh, their uh, uh, society that they have in Tabor because I'm a firm believer there's no, uh, no need to reinvent the wheel. and and they gave us everything that we needed. Um, as Mark also mentioned, myself and Lisa, we've been attending the meetings and we have a, a good core group of people and we're hoping to get this uh, off the ground uh, because there's a definite need. When we first started talking about doing this, you were having minimal uh, uh, need for it because we had hardly any uh, uh, dogs running at, at large. But since we started discussing it, we've been having quite a few, so there's a definite need and I'm also hoping that we can uh, uh, talk to Lethbridge County uh, to get them involved as well. And if you wanted us to, to speak uh, a little bit before I open it up to council as far as what our main goal is as far as getting a facility here in this community. Uh, the goal that we've been talking about in our ad hoc committee is to have a facility which would be a co-located facility where uh, People, residents of Coldale would be able to access animal services in any capacity, whether it be veterinary care or uh, products and services for the animals, uh, bio enforcement if their dog is captured, or a humane society for pet adoptions. And to, to have a facility whereby we would be 
have all of the, access to all of those services in one place uh, so that we can actually draw members of the community, keep them here and as far as local residents go, but also provide that premium facility to draw in people from other areas, from the counties and whatnot. Okay, thank you. So I'll open it up to Council. Uh, Council Avery has a question. Thank you, Mayor. A couple of questions. And let's um, get you to speak up too, Jason. Sure. Um, do we have a terms of reference yet that we would be looking at for this? Like, is it a society, is it a nonprofit or an organization, or is it um, something that is still under the town with uh, citizen members at, like, is it like the library board? Like, I just, I'm not 100% clear of what this society would look like? So uh, thank you for the question. Uh, we do, we have been prov provided with terms of reference from other areas, uh, several of them. And part of the function of this committee would be to review all of those terms of reference to find out what would be the most appropriate um, <coughs> setup for Coldale. Uh, also by, by uh, being an official committee with uh, council members on that, Council will then have uh, a voice in the development process. And, and I, can, I can comment on that as well. So with us getting all that information from the MD at Tabor and the town at Tabor, there were some concerns around FOIP. So we wanted to get it passed at a council level so that uh, to give them the okay uh, to sign uh, non-disclosure agreements with the, the committee members. And then we'll start digging into the paperwork that we received, including the terms of reference from different uh, organizations. And once those terms of reference are done, we can bring those back to council as well. So basically, we're just looking for the okay uh, to get going on this program. So then our council member, the member or members that would be sitting on this committee would be there in an advisory capacity only, not a voting capacity. Is that correct? Um, at this at this point, the committee isn't going to be voting on anything. It's going to be preparing a report to come back, at which time council can make that decision. Um, the committee, uh, once it's an official committee of council, absolutely, who's ever on the committee would have a vote at that committee. Councilor Chapman. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I, I, I echo uh, Councilor Avery's uh, questions and... Uh, and uh, concerns. And my concern would be is that this committee uh, is th this current committee is tasked with a with a, a job or you know a, a tasked with something to to move forward on. And so my question to you would be: Is this committee uh, going to be tasked with continuing to have a committee of council or to eventually form a, a society? Uh, I could only answer from myself as being the interim chair, if you will, mm -hmm. that the ultimate goal is to have this uh, separated off into a, a private group, which is community driven uh, with, with community initiatives, uh, which is separated from council. But at the moment, uh, in the development process, it's important to have uh, council input to the building and the foundations of it. If you see this happening in the next 12 months, or what would your, be the timeline for setting something up, even as a society? To, to set up something as a society, you're looking between now and trying to open the door in operations between two and three years. Okay. And just further to that, then, I, I think in the meantime, it might be helpful as for this committee to, uh, not being a committee of council, that it be introduced on the org chart as, as a committee of, of the town. And second to that, um, that for the for the uh, falls uh, uh, appointments to these committees, that it be part of the uh, the name or the committee appointments that would be registered. So I, I can speak to that too, Councillor Chapman. So again, the purpose of Mark being here this afternoon is just to get council's blessing on forming this committee. Mm -hmm. We do not want this to be an extension of the org chart. We don't want it to involve staff. Mark is only here to get it up and running. And then we have, how many people have we had at that meeting? 15 maybe? We've had uh, upwards of 20 at some okay. of the meetings. We have right now 10 core people who are interested in working on forming a society. Yes. We mm -hmm. have others 
interested in other aspects of, of animal wellness. And we've had somebody uh, stepped up to, to volunteer as chair. So once this is up and running, this is going to be at arm's length of, of council and administration. Like we don't, we don't need to add another you know, like uh, point on the org chart for this. Right. So. Okay. Thank, thank you, Mayor. I, I appreciate that because I just needed some clarity in terms of uh, the okay. agenda. Thank and you. then Councillor Pickering had a question. Thank you. So it would be kind of operating, I would say, under the same pretense as the gem of the West Town would be involved in the building with a society that's formed there with one of our council reps. That's correct. That's, yeah, yes. that works fine. And, and the only reason that uh, Councillor Reese and myself are there because we wanted to be there to get it off the ground along with Mark. And Mark's done a good job of, of uh, of getting people to volunteer and and they've been having the meetings at the fire hall uh, and that works very well so councillor avery thank you Mayor. and just as a follow-up comment um you know with no disrespect to any other society that we've got within our community but every year um, their ask keeps getting more and more from council so every time there's another society or organization formed at arm's length of council, um, they do come back to council with bigger budget assets every year. So, you know, that has to be a key consideration for an organization that is just starting out. They're going to need seed money, and we need to know that it's council right off the bat if we're supporting this, that there will be, and we need to make sure that we are going to support the organization with that seed funding. Well said, and this came to council before where we tasked uh, Mark to start looking into this because obviously we have an animal control issues in the town of Colwell with uh, loose dogs or dogs running at large. We've Myself, I've had several emails regarding cats, but at this point we're not going to be uh, having anything to do with cats as far as this uh, mandate goes. So as far as your comment about funding, there will be funding coming up because uh, at the end of the day, we're looking to have a physical presence where we're going to have a building of some sort. Because right now, the dogs, we have an arrangement. I'll let uh, Mark explain what happens if he picks up the dog. Just so at the present time, we don't have an animal facility here in town. Uh, if we apprehend an animal, uh, it has to be housed at Raymond in the town of Raymond at their animal facility. They only have two dog bays down there, so if they're occupied, we don't have anywhere for them. Uh, we've been extremely fortunate using uh, foster parents here in town for friendly dogs, and uh, it has worked well, but there are times when we've had dogs that have been down there for two weeks in a very tiny little storage facility. It's just not a good idea. Um, the, the challenge is facing everybody in uh, municipal enforcement and, and doing anything with animal control right now is finding placements for them with humane societies for adoptions. They're all full. Um, they're all operating past 100% capacity and the number of abandoned dogs is going through the roof uh, for everybody, not just for us. Councillor Pickering. Thank you, Mayor Van So does the county have their own dog um, shelter or, or are we going to entertain bringing them into the picture because I know we've had lots at work complaints about lost dogs. Well, uh, that's a discussion I, I want to be having with uh, Lethbridge County Reeve. I think there's opportunity like they were doing uh, a similar setup in Tabor with the MD at Tabor and the town of Tabor share a facility. And I believe they each have six stalls in that building we're currently in. <coughs> and then there's uh, arrangements made as far as uh, who covers the costs uh, to keep that place up and running so that's a discussion we still have to have regarding what's currently going on with uh, Lethbridge County I'll let Mark speak to that thank you uh, Lethbridge County does not have a facility of their own um, they are at the same mercy that we are if they have a dog they have to shop around and find a place to take it uh, they have used a facility picture butte uh, Colehurst just built uh, a little two kennel uh, shed that they can use over there if they need to. Uh, but several communities around us have reached out to say it's again it's not adequate. Uh, it's great if you only have a dog for a day or two, but not if you end up with them for longer. 
So there is interest in, in partnerships out there with other communities that surround us. Any more questions for Mark? So before I open it up to the uh, motion options, I'm just going to put Councillor Reese on the spot here. Are you still willing to let your name sit as a council rep? Yeah. Okay, sounds good. <clears throat> so with that being said, we have three option items that council approve the Animal Wellness Committee, that council not approve the Animal, animal Wellness Committee, or that council table a decision. Is there anybody that wants to entertain one of those motions? Councillor Avery. Okay, so the motion will read that Council approve the Animal Wellness Committee as an official Town of Coldale Council Committee and that Council appoint Councillor Lisa Reese uh, to be on the committee. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Good Thank job. You. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Okay, moving down to agenda item 7.1 under bylaws and policies, we're going to be bringing back the Inter-Municipal Development Plan Bylaw 861-P-01-23. Regarding second and third reading, and uh, we have our Director of Growth Investment, Cameron Mills, presenting. Thank you, Mayor Van Ryan. Um, so having spoken uh, about the issue already uh, to Council during the public hearing, uh, I won't go through uh, my report in detail. I will point out, uh, just for clarification, on the issue of the uh, NRCB amendment and also with respect to uh, the regulations for how uh, the application of rules for confined feeding operations. These rules are with respect to confined feeding operations within the uh, what's generally referred to as the plan area, which is in fact that area outside of town within the county. So these rules do not apply uh, to areas within the town itself. Um, interestingly, um, the only confined feeding operation that I can think of offhand uh, within the broader region is in fact within the town. Uh, so there is the dairy uh, farm located in the southwestern corner of the town. So the regulations that we're showing here do not actually technically apply uh, to that uh, particular operation. However, I would suggest that if we were having a conversation about some sort of change uh, with respect to that operation, that we might have certainly used these as some guidance and direction for us to engage in that, but they are not technically uh, intended to be applied that way. So just to follow up to that then, because there's interest in developing uh, that area as part of the uh, area structure plan discussions, that's when that uh, discussion will be held regarding that operation? Uh, most likely. Um, so the area structure, we have received an area structure plan submitted for that area. Uh, we've provided uh, feedback uh, a few weeks ago to that group with respect to how to uh, continue engaging in the process. It's many, many months out uh, before that plan will be complete and before we'll be presenting that plan uh, for Council's consideration. Um, there is the potential, uh, potentially, to discuss uh, the, some change with respect to that parcel in advance of that, but otherwise it would certainly be included <coughs> in that plan discussion. Okay, thank you. I'll open it up to Council. Any questions for Cameron? Councillor Chapman. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, and through to Cam, um, in the bylaw 5.310, you've got some amendments regarding the NRCB uh, allowing uh, existing confined feeding operations, uh, and further that the expansion is no more than 10% increase from the existing animal numbers. So could you define what the existing numbers would be? Would it be today or yesterday, but not tomorrow? Thank you, yes. So the way uh, licenses for confined feeding operations work is they're, they prov are provided a license for a number of uh, cattle, for example. So a confined feeding operation will have a license to have <clears throat> 200 head of cattle within their operation, uh, or 2,000, or whatever the number may be. Um, what we're suggesting here, so what's shown in red is the change relative to what was in the, the so the red is the change to what the NRCB had suggested. They oh, wanted, right. there had previously been a statement to say that we would allow for the consideration of 
sort of a modest uh, increase. And so what we've provided for is a 10% increase. So a 200 head operation could potentially expand to 220 units, but not from 200 to 2000, which is a, an order of magnitude different. The idea being that a 10% change is not significant. You're not going to have significantly more smell or more dust or more traffic from that level of increase. The idea behind the regulation is to say that technically, generally speaking, we don't, gen generally at a high level, we, we come from a place of preferring not to see the expansion of these types of operations. However, if the expand, if a modest expansion also provides for the significant moder uh, modernization uh, of the operation, which might potentially significantly reduce smells and owners and, and things like that, then potentially the trade-offs are such that we might look favorably upon that. And so that's the idea behind that regulation. I guess maybe just to follow up to that, thank you, Cam, and that is that that in this expansion of 10%, uh, like I said, you know, what we deal with today and then next year's numbers uh, reflect 220 head. Uh, so they are, they're allowed another 20, 10% above that. So, you know, I, I'm just yeah. concerned about the, the, the increase that way. Right. So to be clear, the regulations don't say that you're allowed to extend by 10%. They say that you might potentially be allowed to expand up to 10%. So if the town looked at something and even with a 10% increase, we looked at the variables and said, this is not good for the town and it was happening in the county, we would provide our feedback to say, no, we don't support this. And the NRCB would take the town's position of not supporting it. And that would likely strongly influence the NRCB's decision whether or not to give that. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions to Cameron? With that being said, then, does someone care to sponsor second reading of the Intermunicipal Development Plan Bylaw 861-P-01-23? Councillor Pickering, any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. Thank you. And does someone care to sponsor third reading, please? Deputy Mayor Beekman, any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Carmen, you just stay there, okay? <clears throat> Moving on to agenda item 7.2, the land use bylaw amendment bylaw 863 P 02-23, first reading. And uh, we have our Director of Growth and Investment, uh, Cameron Mills, once again presenting. Go ahead, Cam. Thank you. So, uh, item 7.2 and, and 7.3 are, are very similar in nature. So, I'll uh, maybe do the bulk of my discussion here at 7.2 and then we can move on to 7.3. Uh, so bylaw 863, uh, 7.2 is bylaw 863-P-02-23 uh, that we're providing for first reading. And this is to provide for the rezoning of the lands in what is known as the third phase of the Civic Square project, which is to say the outdoor phase of the Civic Square project. Uh, and based on some feedback received at the last meeting, uh, what we're proposing here for first reading is rezoning not to institutional recreational, but rather to direct control. Uh, the benefit of which being that uh, at when Dustin Yankee had presented some of the requirements for the siting of some of the infrastructure, uh, this provides, uh, first of all, an easier means uh, for dealing with uh, some of the waiver setbacks with respect to the siting of, of uh, say, for example, the outdoor uh, rink uh, canopy posts and so on and so forth. Um, and it also ensures that a decision on those development permits is made by council and not the Municipal Planning Commission, uh, which is to say that once the uh, permit is to be issued for these uh, works, that that permit will be presented to council for consideration rather than presenting that same permit application to the Planning Commission. Otherwise, uh, the process is fundamentally the same. Uh, it is the town that is applying for the permits in this case, so we would be the applicant and council would have a decision to make uh, at, a, at a later date of council. We're not considering that here today. We're simply considering the rezoning at this time. Any further questions? Thank you, Cameron. So. I'd be looking for someone to uh, make a motion that council provides first reading of land use 
redesignation bylaw 863-P-02-23 and set the public hearing. I'm on the wrong one, sorry. Back up one. <clears throat> that council provides sec uh, no, March 27th. Yes. That council provides first reading and with the public hearing date and time as March 27, 2023 at 5.05 p.m. Is that correct? Yes, uh, I might note um, if we look at item 7.3, we had recommended 5.10 p.m. for that public hearing. Um, since doing this, we've had a conversation. It's very reasonable to do a single public hearing for both of these bylaws. So when we're considering item 7.3, I might suggest that we make that public hearing jointly at 5.05 p.m. as well. Because when I was reading this off, you were giving me the stink on it. Well, no, that's mistakes. just my normal thing. <laughs> <laughs> would, yeah, would it be helpful then to have the second presentation and then include that into the one motion? Uh, no, because it's two different staff reports, two, yeah. two motions. So okay. who would care to sponsor that one? Councillor Reese sponsors that council provide first reading of land use re redesignation bylaw 863-P dash zero two dash two three and set the public hearing date and time is march 27th 2023 at 505 pm any further discussion seeing none i'll call the discussion all the, or question all those in favor carried unanimously thank you carry on to 7.3 regarding land use bylaw amendment 864-p-02-23 uh, first reading Cameron, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, this is fundamentally the same. This bylaw relates to the western uh, lots rather than the eastern lots. Those lots are currently zoned uh, commercial. And again, the proposal is to rezone to direct control uh, for the same purposes as the previous bylaw. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion on that item? Seeing none, then I'll need a, someone to sponsor motion that council provide first reading of land use uh, redesignation bylaw 864-P-02-23 and set the public hearing date and time as March 27th, 2023 at 5.05 p.m. to run in conjunction with uh, agenda item 7.2. And Councillor Saylor indicated he wanted to sponsor that one. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? carried unanimously. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item 7.4, the West Area Structure Plan Rezoning Bylaw 865-P-02-23 regarding first reading. And again, we have our Director of Growth and Investment, Cameron Mills, presenting. Go ahead, Cam. Thank you very much. So uh, what's being presented here, Bylaw 865 p dash zero two dash two three uh, is first reading of a bylaw that would provide for rezoning of lands within what is known as the west area structure plan area which is the residential the residential development proposed west of the existing westgate subdivision uh, what we have here is uh, first reading of a bylaw the intention of this is this allows us then to uh, mirror the rezoning process to the area structure plan process and so be uh, currently planning for the second and third reading of the area structure plan to be considered at our next meeting uh, in later in March. Uh, that area structure plan has already received first reading. That area structure plan reflects the zonings uh, that are shown here. We have found it advantageous to do the area structure plan process and the zoning process uh, at the same time at public hearings. And the reason for that is that the way our area structure plans work is they generally provide for pretty clear indication of what the proposed zoning within the area is going to be. And because we adopt these things in an area structure plan, we found administratively that the likelihood of approving an area structure plan and then a month later not approving the zoning shown in the area structure plan is uh, difficult to foresee. And what we can have is perhaps uh, difficulty for the general public understanding the difference uh, between the two documents and what we don't want is for uh, members of the public that have concerns to maybe not come to the area structure plan process not necessarily understanding what the word area structure plan means and then come a month later to a rezoning hearing with significant concerns and our response is 
we just considered the area structure plan a month ago, right? And so we want to make sure that people have not only the opportunity for input, but, but really valuable input. And so we actually find that doing zoning, the, this, the, the difference between zoning and the area structure plan is very important for us administratively, but for the general public, less so. And so by combining the processes together, it ensures that there's no uh, mistakes made by folks who maybe don't spend all of their time in the development process and maybe don't understand all the uh, regulations and how things work. And we just find that it's actually uh, a far clearer and fairer process to do them together. And so our preference is really to do that where we know that a rezoning application is going to come very, very quickly after uh, an area structure plan process. And so we've done this previously um, for the industrial park. And we found that very, uh, very helpful. We didn't do it this way, for example, for the South Area Structure Plan uh, that was approved when was that, a year or two ago. Um, and, and, and we had the same problem. We approved the Area Structure Plan a month later, we considered rezoning, and we had folks come only to the rezoning hearing to express concerns about some of the multifamily areas, which were clearly reflected in the Area Structure Plan. And because the Area Structure Plan provides guidance to rezoning, uh, they had limited ability to sort of uh, make their case effectively and we found that to be less than ideal and so we've we've preferred to adopt this moving forward so this uh, passing first reading of this bylaw will allow us to then include rezoning as portion of the public hearing uh, later in March and to make sure that we can hear sort of broadly all concerns at that time thank you I'll open it up for questions for Cameron pretty straightforward thank you Cam so we're looking for someone to sponsor first reading of the West Area Structure Plan Rezoning Bylaw 865-P-02-23 and set the public hearing date and time as March 27, 2023 at 5.15 p.m. Councilor Avery makes that motion. Any further discussion? Sorry, and I believe, uh, if I may, I believe that was advertised at... 5.30 or 5.45 p.m. I cannot recall. Uh, Lana provided me with that note, but I clearly didn't write it down. So what I might recommend is that uh, the date and time of the public hearing be left uh, open and we can mirror it uh, at that. There's not a technical requirement for council to pass the date and time of the public hearing and we can simply uh, mirror those with the area structure. Or CAO is just looking into that, so. That also works. I believe 5.30 is the time. Getting confirmation shortly. Okay. We can we can come back to that motion. So let's move on to uh, item seven point five. The off-site levy bylaw. Oh, there comes Lana. Uh, 515. Is it 515? Oh, okay. Oh, we did change it. Okay, never mind. Okay, so just one more time then. Uh, Council Avery's uh, made a motion to pass first reading for the West Area Structure Plan Rezoning Bylaw 865-P-02-23 and set the public hearing date and time as March 27th, 2023 at 5 15 p.m. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item 7.5, uh, the off-site levy bylaw 866-P-03-23 regarding first reading. And again, we have our Director of Growth and Investment, Cameron Mills, presenting. Go ahead, Cam. Thank you very much. So have an opportunity to consider bylaw 866-P-0323 uh, for first reading. And this is the uh, offsite levy bylaw here for the town of Coaldale. And this provides the town with the opportunity to update uh, the offsite levies, which are currently charged as part of the development process uh, for major developments in town. Provided council uh, with an update to this process back in September, we've been working uh, on the process for approximately a year now. 
and uh, we're happy to be getting to the point where we're ready to consider uh, the bylaw for adoption. So uh, beginning first, uh, just to provide council with a, a refresher and also anyone listening at home, uh, what offsite levies are is a charge that is applied uh, to major developments to help fund uh, the expansion of uh, existing infrastructure that's required to accommodate growth. The fundamental idea is to ensure that growth uh, pays for growth rather than existing residents uh, carrying the burden of subsidizing that growth. And so what this means is obviously when a developer, say, takes a quarter section and builds a neighborhood, of course the developer is responsible for 100% of the costs of installing the roads, for example, or installing the water lines and the sewer systems, what have you, uh, and that's well understood. But that development also creates a burden on existing infrastructure, so it contributes to the need to expand the existing sewer system uh, or the lagoons, for example, or it contributes to intersection upgrades at major areas because it adds traffic to those areas. And so off-site levies are a charge that municipal municipalities charge those developers to help fund uh, those projects. Uh, the calculation of those levies is uh, fairly rigorous and it involves uh, looking at all the projects that exist uh, within the town that are forecast within documents like our infrastructure master plan or transportation master plan, uh, things like that, uh, assigning uh, dates or projected dates to when those okay. might occur, um, considering how much growth is uh, requiring that versus how much of that project might be directed towards uh, existing ratepayers. It has an inflation calculation built in, so if a project is a uh, million dollars today and we know that it's uh, projected to happen in 2037, we apply, but the numbers, uh, but the numbers are say from 2018, we apply either real inflation numbers for previous years or forecasted inflation numbers uh, for future years to try to best predict what the cost of some of these projects will be. Obviously, it's all forecasting. Uh, we're unable to say um, concretely what an intersection upgrade is gonna cost in 2042, uh, but we do our best uh, to include those calculations as rigorously as possible in order to ultimately come up with a levy number. Um, so, for, and, uh, so what that might mean then is to say, okay, if there's a project uh, that is triggered uh, by growth. So for example, if a neighborhood is being developed and because of that development, um, one more house creates a trigger of say needing to upgrade the intersection with the highway. And that intersection with the highway is going to cost $2 million. If levies don't exist, um, we would either pay for it ourselves as the town to the developer's significant benefit, um, or we would look to the developer and say, well, because you're the one building the neighborhood that creates this cost, we'll levy a development charge separate from levies on you to fund that infrastructure improvement. The problem there being that that basically levies the charge against the last person to develop that sort of triggers the, the development rather than the people who incrementally developed leading up to that trigger point. And so levies are a way of sharing the costs across all developments to try to smooth out the, the peaks and valleys of, of some of these charges because the projects don't happen incrementally. The projects are projects there. They're either $4 million or zero. It's not uh, modest over time, for example. So that's the idea behind levies. That's what offsite levies uh, fundamentally are. The Municipal Government Act provides the town with the ability to charge these levies. Uh, they're specifically listed in the Municipal Government and Act and in fact, in the 2018 uh, rewrite of the Municipal Government Act, the ability to uh, of what can be included in levies was in fact expanded. So um, we were allowed uh, previously to levy for water projects, wastewater projects, transportation infrastructure, uh, stormwater infrastructure, things of that nature. Post-2018, we have the ability to consider uh, uh, facilities. So for example, we could theoretically say uh, we have a pool project planned um, that's a $20 million project and we are going to levy against new development to fund that project. Fire halls, libraries, things of that nature can be included in the levy calculation. We have not used those facilities uh, to derive our levy calculation. They're not included in our calculation. Uh, but the opportunity to do so does exist. Uh, the project is being undertaken uh, by the town. 
we have uh, we went out to tender and ISL engineering uh, won the bid to provide some support this is super beneficial to us because the consultants that we work with have been involved in the offsite levy uh, process a number of times the folks uh, that we have here uh, certainly use offsite levies but we don't necessarily have a lot of experience uh, developing uh, new levies because this is not something the municipality does every and so we benefited from the experience of professional engineers who have done this in other municipalities, understand how to best go about this. Uh, we have representatives of the planning department, we have engineering department representation, and in fact, Jason Stevens, our manager of development engineering, has uh, devoted uh, hundreds of hours of his time over the last year to this project, and, and in my opinion, has done a tremendous job. Uh, I have participated, we've had Kyle Pochon from our corporate services team, uh, our director, is he the director of finance? I can't remember CFO. his title. CFO, that's the one, uh, has participated. We've also had council representation on a committee uh, with Mayor Van Ryan, Councillor Pickering, and Councillor Avery. Uh, our existing levy rates are $85,500 per gross hectare, and that's a number that would have been established uh, back in 2009. Uh, we have not updated the levy since that time. Uh, clearly, the town has changed significantly since 2009, and also uh, the cost of doing business has also changed significantly since 2009. Um, typically, levy rates would be reviewed more than once every uh, 14 years, and that's something that we would uh, certainly uh, like to see us do. Uh, moving forward. To provide a frame of reference, uh, in 2010, uh, our rates were at 85500 per gross hectare. Uh, the city would have been at 149000 per net hectare at that time. So net hectares means that certain uh, areas of land are removed from the calculation, so that reduces the overall payment from the developer. So 149000 per net hectare is probably closer to 135 per gross hectare for example. So there would have been about a $50,000 per hectare gap at the time that that was created. Um, the city raised that five years later to $239,000 per, per net hectare, uh, then to two eighty one dollars in 2020. They held that steady uh, during sort of the, the COVID years, not wanting to create additional burden there. However, uh, starting in 2023, that value has increased to $290,000 per hectare, and uh, thereby law uh, has a set increase every year for a four-year period. They are at $316,000 per hectare uh, in 2026. So obviously the discount from 316 to 85 is very significant uh, from our opinion. Uh, Colehurst initially, for example, established a rate of 96,000 and increased that to 126 uh, in 2017, though they are, still, again, they are six years removed from looking at uh, their levy rates. Tabor is uh, quite low at 74,761. Again, that's for 2015 number. I would suggest that Tabor's probably looking at uh, updating that as well. The uh, report from ISL that's provided provides for a more comprehensive look. We look at Okotoks, I believe, and High River, uh, a number of areas. So there's definitely a, a significant range uh, that can be charged for these types of things. What uh, we are ultimately proposing, or at least initially, through our through the, the, the work that we've done is we came and found that a, a value of approximately 185000 per net hectare uh, was an appropriate uh, value looking at the infrastructure projects that we were looking at. Uh, we took that number and we went, uh, we contacted the development community directly and invited them to participate and to come back and provide us with feedback, uh, which is a relatively small community, but there would have been uh, eight or nine developers that have taken undertaken significant projects or who are significant developers in the region who are invited to participate. We did have uh, two of those developers engage with us directly. One uh, is a residential developer that's done a number of residential developments within the town. Another is uh, principally a commercial developer uh, who's also interested in engaging in residential uh, development in the future. Uh, generally speaking, the feedback there, uh, when we explain the logic behind the number, uh, was that obviously the number is an increase and a significant one. However, uh, it was described as being reasonably fair, providing a $100,000 approx or more discount relative to the city uh, to sort of uh, provide for a reasonable incentive to develop in Coaldale versus uh, Lethbridge, which we would look at as our principal competitor for development investment. Um, they did note, however, that one change that could be made would be greater flexibility with respect to the timing of payments. So to provide uh, some 
some analysis of that. Um, when a developer pays these levies, right now in the town, our levies are low. However, um, basically a developer needs to pay, I believe it's 50% of the levy immediately upon subdivision, and then the additional 50% within uh, a matter of, I believe it's four months. Uh, so it's very, very quick. And so levies might be, for example, $2 million on a project, uh, that's going to fund infrastructure improvements. However, those infrastructure improvements might not take place for one or two or three years. And if a developer is borrowing that $2 million at an interest rate, uh, typically developers for land projects borrow significantly above prime. So they might be borrowing at 10%, 12%, 15%. Uh, that's a significant burden they feel. Um, more than feel it, it is a significant burden. We recognize that. And so their thought is it might be nice for the ability to consider uh, more deferrals of those payments until uh, throughout the construction process in order to allow for less of a burden on their overall cash flow. Um, so we have provided a bylaw that provides for the opportunity but not the requirement uh, to do so based on when we can analyze projects needing to happen, if that makes sense. Um, ultimately, what came back then as we reviewed, um, as more information came in, and then as we considered existing values we have in balances within our levy accounts, that number was refined down to the number that is presented, which is $178,487 per net hectare. Uh, the way we are proposing to calculate net hectares is uh, exactly the same as the way the City of Lethbridge bylaw is written. The purpose of being exactly the same as the City of Lethbridge is that when we are discussing with the development community what our levies are versus what the cities are, we can make sure that we're doing an apples to apples comparison. It provides for greater, greater clarity. Um, the attached report, uh, as mentioned, provides uh, really helps us understand the methodology, how we arrive at that $178,000 number. Um, administratively, we looked at the project and said, um, there is a reality of, of infrastructure investment that we need to consider, uh, but we need to balance that between being, you know, arriving at a number that is reasonable. So when you consider what the MGA allows us to do, it's certainly possible for us to come up with a mathematical calculation that would drive that levy number into the 300s. Uh, but then we need to consider whether or not that would make it impossible to attract investment to the community based on pricing ourselves on the market. And so we found uh, basically the way we've manipulated that is to, is to pick and choose uh, major infrastructure projects focusing on roads uh, within, the, within our master plans, focusing on uh, stormwater, wastewater, and water. So for example, we aren't including things like uh, pool expansions or fire halls or things like that, which would significantly drive up the amount that we'd be pulling in. We, we've left those out in order to achieve a number that certainly funds uh, principal infrastructure costs without, we feel, rendering us uh, in a difficult competitive position. With that said, we would also encourage Council, when considering the bylaw, um, after we, we do first reading, to uh, you know consider balancing those issues in your analysis. Uh, administration's position is not that the levy has to be uh, one thing or another. What we want to do is make sure that we're arming council with the ability to make a sound decision with respect to these levies. The reality is that money not collected in levies is either either means that infrastructure projects don't happen or that the burden is put is placed on the taxpayer and ultimately at budget time is something that you know the, the tax rates need to fund. And so <clears throat> Uh, we want to strive to find that balance between attracting investment and having levy rates that, that provide an appropriate contribution for those amounts. And that's ultimately something that council needs to consider prior to uh, adopting any bylaw. When you consider um, some of the levy rates provided a breakdown here, but when we're looking at that $178,000 levy rate and you're comparing it to, say, uh, a project uh, in the city of Lethbridge. And so to provide a comparison of how our rate uh, differs from the city's rate, um, if you're looking at uh, if you're looking at a rate uh, currently versus or, or in four years, the difference is fundamentally for a quarter section, which is 65.2 hectares, we would assume the net hectareage calculation, which removes say arterial roads, which 
don't actually have any arterial roads in Coaldale. Uh, we have collector roads, our biggest roads, arterial roads are even more significant. Uh, it re removes arterial roads because of the net public benefit of those. So Métis Trail and Lethbridge would be an example, for example, of a arterial road, uh, municipal reserve contributions, things, things like that. We suggest 60, 60 net hectares is a reasonable assumption. On a 60 net hectare project, uh, the savings for Coaldale versus Lethbridge uh, in 2023 is $6.7 million to the developer, uh, and that increases to $8.3 million in 2023 based on the city's rates. We are not proposing a rate that increases every year. Uh, we feel that because we've built a, an inflation adjustment into our initial calculations, uh, that keeping uh, keeping that number in place for a four-year period is a reasonable As far as uh, stakeholder engagement, again, we had direct engagement with the development community. Um, we've incorporated that feedback into uh, the bylaw, and we think it's it's incorporated well into the bylaw. Uh, there is not a requirement for a public hearing for an offsite levy bylaw, but we think it's reasonable to have one. Um, and so we are recommending that we consider having uh, having that uh, prior to, to that consideration. Uh, and we are suggesting that we would look for second and third reading at the, uh, likely at the second meeting in April. So there will be some time uh, to provide for uh, online engagement on this issue to receive feedback. Generally speaking, this is a very complex issue, so we don't generally engage uh, with the general public outside of the development community. People are certainly welcome to provide that feedback, but it is very technical in nature. Um, and so if people don't spend their time in this, it can be difficult to provide an opinion. Thank you, Cameron. Yeah. <laughs> So quick question for just back up your mentioning regarding the uh, public hearing. So if we decide to have a public hearing, when was the date for that? Proposing the, uh, I believe it's April 24th is the date. So we wouldn't recommend setting a public hearing date uh, in council. Our intention would simply be to to establish one prior to bringing second. Yeah. 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 I'll open up to council. Any questions for Cameron? Deputy Mayor Beekman. Uh, thank you, Mayor Van Ryan. Yeah, I got a couple here. Uh, first, in regards to deferrals. So, um, uh, I, I still believe that uh, you know, e even though the the levies are going to be going up, we still need to have a cut and dry uh, deadline um, and more go the road of allowing for deferral Here's application. Um, I, I just think we need a, a, a really good structure in there, just so. You know, people can't interpret their own rules, um, whether that was already planned or not. Um, just when you're talking about deferrals there, I just thought about that. If I may, yeah. uh, so the idea is that the deferrals provide for so the next stage. Um, how levies work is we do the area structure plan process, we do rezoning, then we do subdivision, uh, where, you know, the intention of creating the lots, and that's something that's approved by the planning commission. One of the conditions of subdivision uh, so when the MPC approves a subdivision, they say we're approving this subject to meeting the following conditions. Subdivision registration with land titles doesn't occur until the town determines that the conditions of subdivision have been met. Taxes are paid, for example, is a standard condition. Another standard condition is that the developer enter into a development agreement with the town. That's always the case. The development agreement is where we we work uh, we enter into a legal agreement with the developer on um, all of the aspects of the infrastructure that's being built by the developer. So, how long they're going to warranty the roads, for example, or what to what spec um, the tree, the caliper of the trees within the parks. Like it's very very detailed, and it is within the development agreement that we establish the levy rate. And it is within the development agreement that we establish the timelines for payment. So there is no interpretation by the developer, nor would there be under our proposal. What we're suggesting here is, for example, uh, with the industrial park, we talked about providing them because of the special uh, case involved with the, with the industrial park and the sort of general public benefit. One of the ways we can help incentivize uh, millions of dollars of investment in developing new uh, industrial land is to provide them with the ability to pay the levies uh, as uh, sales occur rather than, uh, so, so it's registered fundamentally <clears throat> against the titles and for those levies to be paid incrementally uh, throughout the process with a time limit to that, to say like, well, it's fine, 
to wait as sales occur, however, at X point, whatever remains due is to be paid. And so the developer has to meet them. There is no ability for them to transfer title from one party to another without meeting the obligations of that agreement because that agreement is registered on the titles and in fact would take precedence to a mortgage, for example. So a bank is going to look at that and they're saying, we're not gonna finance until this condition is removed. Therefore, we need to see this being paid. So it's very, very, very structured. Um, all this does is provides us the legal opportunity to do that if there's a determined benefit to doing that. If that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, second question I had there was uh, uh, regarding the public hearing, you know, given that you've already uh, had consultation with developers, uh, this bylaw pertains to developers. Um, is there, is, do you see a large benefit to waiting till the end of April with construction season around the corner? Wouldn't it be more beneficial to the town to get this bylaw uh, moving in the new levy rates in place uh, for construction season? Thank you. Yeah. So as far as construction season occurs, uh, again, the levy rates aren't applied until the development agreement is signed uh, post subdivision. So if someone came in with a subdivision application today, we would take that application, review it, then we'd send it out to external agencies, Alberta Transportation to review. They would take a month to get back to us you wouldn't see a subdivision application come to the MPC until the May subdivision right now. And then if that were approved in the second week of May, then we'd have to enter into the development agreement, which would likely carry us into June. So doing this in April does not, uh, th there's no way that anything that hasn't already applied for subdivision would be not caught within this April timeline. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any further questions for Cameron? Councilor Chapman. Yeah, thank you, Mayor, and uh, through to Cameron, thanks for offering clarity on the net versus the gross hectare <coughs> situation. I think that's kind of messed me up altogether now <laughs> in terms of trying to figure out what, you know, um, from a broader perspective, what we should be um, considering for Coaldale. And you've made some good, good comparisons with the city of Lethbridge, uh, you know, from 2010 to to 2022, um, they increased their levy by 95 percent. The way I understand, the way I read that. So, we're proposing almost for the same period of time, um, um, more than that. So, it'd be over a hundred percent increase. So, <clears throat> I guess just the optics uh, to me is that if we were to play apple for apple, play apple for apple. Um, I think we should try to keep it below that bar. Um, the second point I, I would make is that um, with reference to the city of Calgary, High River and Manton, I think they broke down their, pay, their payment plans rather than 50% up front and 50% later, like what you're proposing, is to break down over a, a much more um, understandable time. So for this example, the city of Calgary, I think it's 10% at the time of development application, development approval, and then 40% and then 40% after three three years. So um, I like those kinds of terms uh, rather than trying to uh, trying to go and go go for the full 100% up front. Um, so those are kind of my terms. I would like to see it um, kept under 95%. So that brings it down to uh, your net uh, hectare uh, value of 178000 If I may. Um, so our approach there, uh, I absolutely understand the thought process behind that. Our thought process was really to look at the relative discount. And so the relative discount when the rates were established was approximately 50000 a hectare. Um, what we're proposing is in year one of the city's new four-year bylaw to provide for approximately $112,000 hectare discount, uh, which is a doubling of the discount relative to uh, the same in 2010. And in fact, because the city's rates go to 316, we're talking about almost $130,000 hectare discount, um, which is getting to the which is still approaching the point of half, right? Um, so from our perspective, while the percentage increase is, is greater than the city's percentage increase over that same period, though in fact a little less than the 2026 number, um, 
the percentage increase, in our opinion, is less important than the real dollar uh, discount that we're providing. Uh, in real terms, we're talking about saving developers six to eight million dollars. Uh, in our opinion, that makes investing in Coaldale attractive enough relative to a similar project in City West Lethbridge. Yeah. The final thing uh, before we go to the uh, is uh, if we could build into this um, offsite levy program uh, a review in five years, so that by what are we at? 23, so 26 even, or 20, 26, you start reviewing it for 28, so that you're not playing this catch-up game, you know, and especially if the if the economy goes up or down, uh, you know, it can determine a, a number of a number of things in terms of economic development for, for Coldale particularly. So Absolutely. as per the staff report, Cameron is recommending four years. Four years? Okay. Yep. So to Something be clear, like um, yeah. so what we're fundamentally proposing is at a staff level, we'll review it once a year just okay. to see what the landscape is. Uh, we can provide an update to council once a year. Uh, so it might, for example, we can include it in one of our quarterly reports, uh, which I know are so informative uh, and, and wonderful. Um, and then what we're suggesting is that basically once every council term, uh, we would. We don't want to. We don't want to uh, have a recommendation that forces a review, uh, simply because what we're doing then is we're forcing the next group. Uh, while the next group might be the same as the current group, the next group to spend um, you know, upwards. You know, maybe it's thirty thousand dollars on uh, a full scale review, and so we want to make sure that we <coughs> give that council the opportunity to authorize that project. But our recommendation will be to engage in that every four year period. Thank you. Just go ahead, Councillor Pickering. Thank you, Thank you very much. So, on the 178, just to clarify this, you built in inflation on this for up to four years? If I may. Um, so. There is an, okay. So on page 153 of the uh, ISL report, um, or sorry, 153 of the council agenda, I should say, um, page 12 of the ISL report. Um, so we used real inflation rates from 2016 uh, to 2022. So ranging from 0.89% uh, to using a 6.8% value in 2022. The reason we need to calculate inflation for 2019 is that some of our numbers are projects which were costed in 2018, for example. Um, and then we go to 3.2% in 2023, 2.4% in 2024, 2.2 for two years, and then 2% every year from 2027 to 2047. So if we have a project that's forecasted for 2037, it takes the whatever the, if and the, and the budget number is from 2018, it applies that inflation rate every year to tell us what the forecasted cost of that project is in that year. Because we have these inflation calculations, um, they're unlikely to be correct. I mean, they, we can't, if I could forecast inflation for next year, I'd be very wealthy. Um, but it does a reasonable job. And so over a four-year period, it's unlikely to be significantly uh, a significant variable. But again, that every four years ensures that we don't get caught uh, by a significant inflation year that wasn't accounted for. Thank you. Any further questions for Cameron? Seeing none, I'll just read out the motion options. Option one, approve first reading of offsite levy bylaw 866-P-03-23 as presented or as amended, or we can table offsite levy bylaw 866-P-03-23. Does anyone care to sponsor one of those motions? Councillor Reese. Thank you, Mayor Van Ryan. I will sponsor uh, the first option, approve first reading of off-site levy bylaw 866-P-03-23 as presented. Thank you. There's a motion on the floor. Any further discussion? Uh, Councilor, or Deputy Mayor Beekman. Thank you, Mayor. Should we be including the date of the public hearing into this, uh, into this motion? If I Go may, ahead. because a public hearing isn't required, um, we don't feel that we need to include that uh, here this way. 
uh, for whatever reason, if we decide we need to push it back to the first April meeting uh, or into the first May meeting, we have the opportunity to uh, set a public hearing that's appropriate with consideration of second and third reading. So we'll, for example, take the bylaw and review it with uh, through a legal lens and make sure that all our I's are dotted and T's are crossed. Um, that might impact our ability to move forward with it, though I don't foresee that to be the case. Sure. So just to be clear then you're of the opinion that we should be having a public hearing no i was just curious to know with the intention of having the public hearing if we should be including the date of the public hearing in the uh in in the motion if i may speak to the issue of the public hearing um public hearing is not required uh in the municipal government act for this type of bylaw mm -hmm. however because what we're doing is passing a bylaw that might involve us sending a bill in the millions of dollars to a potential developer, uh, in the event that the uh, offsite levy bylaw is challenged uh, in the legal system, the more engagement we've work we've done, uh, the better uh, our case uh, before a judge to say the opportunity to address this was provided and was not taken. And so for that reason, we do feel that while it's not required, the cost of doing a public hearing is minimal. Um, there is the potential for uh, interesting information to come forward, and we feel that it's a it's an appropriate thing to do mm -hmm. for that. Yeah, way. just for clarity, I, yeah. I don't feel that it's uh, necessary as, you, as you've already done your due diligence, but you've expressed uh, the interest in having a public uh, public hearing on the last meeting of April. So that's why I asked. Sounds good, Councillor Chapman. Uh, maybe further to that, Mayor. Uh, there has been a cup, uh, an open house or two, right, on this? No, that, just direct, just the consultation session. With the two developers yeah. that you were speaking, okay. Yeah. Kaylin. One potential compromise that council could add to the motion, that a public hearing be held at a future date and just not state what the date is. That way, in the minutes and the record, it shows and signals council's intention to add that procedural step in subsequent Good cast. Would you accept that friendly amendment? Yes, I would. Okay, thank you. There's a motion on the floor. Any further discussion? I'll call the question. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Okay, on. Moving on to agenda item 9.1. Departmental reports. Uh, we have again our director of growth and investment, Cameron Mills, presenting on uh, growth and investment department quarter one report. Thank you. Uh, and thank you to CAO Hastings. I am parched <laughs> for some reason. Um, so we have the opportunity, uh, like every department uh, in the town, to provide quarterly updates to council. And the way uh, we have structured these, because our um, because our department does a variety of different things. We try to uh, do something different every quarter. And what we like to do in the Q1 report is to do a more comprehensive breakdown of our development statistics uh, from the previous year to provide council with a sense of what's happening from a development per uh, permit perspective, a building permit perspective, uh, provide a bit of an analysis of what uh, some of our comparator municipalities look like and that can help us understand the relative economic health of the town. Um, what you'll find in the attached report is uh, largely uh, positive information. So uh, we are uh, outpacing our peers in terms of attracting investment and steady growth uh, in our non-residential assessment base. And uh, that's something that our strategic plan outlines as being something we want to continue working towards. Uh, and it is something we're excited to continue uh, doing. There is uh, some information which is perhaps uh, less positive, though it, it is certainly very interesting uh, as it relates to uh, development permit information, uh, specifically with a limited number of new home permits that were issued in 2022. So we did have uh, only 13 of those uh, in 2022, and we'll get into that a little bit as we look at the report. Uh, so I'm just going to come down here. And so this is uh, obviously uh, a lot of information. It's hard to see, but I'll speak to it. I believe you can have it on your screens. Um, so this provides uh, what's known as our development summary. And so this looks down at the development permit information within the town. 
uh, which is to say the development permit information, not the building permit information. The building permits are completed by superior safety codes here in the town. Um, this provides information with respect to permit numbers as well as permit values. Development permit values are to be fairly loosely interpreted. Um, there is no double checking. If someone says their project is worth $20,000, that's what goes into the spreadsheet because it doesn't really affect anything else. So we don't devote a lot of resources to double checking those values. Um, what is interesting, I think, in this report, certainly um, a reasonable number of total permits, 134 total permits, um, a significant number of uh, compliance letters, so that shows uh, transactions, largely residential transactions that the town is providing input on within the town. So when someone sells their house, they get a real property report, uh, send it to us, we confirm, yes, it meets the land use, but you're not, we're not gonna show up with a bulldozer two weeks after you buy it and say your shed's in the wrong location. So a uh, reasonable number of transactions occurring with 80 compliance letters. Um, what is interesting is the new housing starts, and this shows 17. Four of those are in the season, so that's a, a mobile nature. So what we approved in 2022 is 13 uh, sort of traditionally constructed houses. Uh, these wouldn't be reflected necessarily in exactly what's built because the development current permit occurs prior to construction. What is most interesting, though, about this is we've, we've had conversations uh, around the council table about uh, some of the... Uh, limits uh, we've seen in the town with respect to the supply of new lots that are available in town and how from our perspective um, the town's growth over the last few years has been limited a little bit uh, by uh, from when the Westgate subdivision uh, fundamentally sold out and so what we have now is 13 permits being issued nine of which are in Cottonwood Estates and Fieldstone Realistically speaking, housing construction in those two subdivisions would only be feasible when you look at the town's uh, average, you know, the average income of people within the town for the upper, probably quartile uh, of residents within the town. And so um, we've got 70% of our homes being built in neighborhoods that reasonably accommodate 25% uh, of people in town, plus or minus a few numbers. but. Reasonably speaking, Cottonwood is a, is a high price point. Fieldstone is a very high price point within the broader market. Uh, and yet, nine out of 13 development permits are occurring in those subdivisions. And so that tells me that while these numbers are low, it's reasonable that if a uh, product comes online that serves uh, what is typically the midpoint of the market, Parkside generally caters to the lower a price point of the regional market, Cottonwood to the high section of the market, and Fieldstone to the very high section of the market. Um, when additional lots come on board, we can reasonably expect to see a significant influx uh, of, of uh, permit applications at that time. Part of this is going to be dictated by the fact that in 2022, interest rates were such that uh, generally the people that could afford to build might have, or the people that were less impacted by interest rates were probably the people that had more disposable income. So part of that is gonna be reflected here, uh, but more broadly, we can reasonably expect that number to align with uh, supply. We would have seen uh, 40 to 50 uh, development permits for houses being built uh, in 2017 and 2018 prior to Westgate achieving that relatively sold out status. So we are hopeful that when more, uh, some of our new res uh, subdivisions come online to see an uptick um, in, in line with the fact that we have more supply available. So we're excited about that. Question for you, Cameron. Yes. So you show on there, there are seven per, uh, permits under institutional. Can you give us an example of institutional, please? Sure. Um, so right here. Okay, so uh, this could include any work that's happening uh, at the school. This might be the town's um, investments. Uh, I think technically the Birds of Prey Center uh, is included uh, in this value. So there would be, they're generally speaking, institutional values is public type uses. Um, and in fact, when we look at the uh, building permit numbers, that will be reflected very heavily in a very exciting way. Um, so when we do comparative analysis, so we always like to look at, um, to provide some context to numbers, well, if, is, is, a, is 130 permits a lot? 
well, I don't know. What are Tabor's numbers? What are Blackfeld's numbers? So we look at Tabor and Blackfeld's. The reason for that is that, again, Tabor is 15 minutes down the road, approximately the same size, within the same economic region. So if the economy is good in Coaldale, it's probably good in Tabor. If the economy is bad in Coaldale, it's probably bad in Tabor. Uh, and then we also like to look at Blackfeld's because Blackfeld's is a uh, town that is immediately outside of a city of 100,000 people in Red Deer, so it, it makes a lot of sense. Black Falls is about 25% bigger than Coldale, uh, but still it's a, it's a good thing to look at. So we look at building permit values because building permits are far more accurate uh, than development permits. So because the value of a building permit, uh, it, it, what the project's valuation on the building permit uh, affects the price of the building permit. Uh, for that reason, there's far more assessment done of what the values of the projects are. And so when we look at these, and because this is tracked by Statistics Canada, uh, this is make sure that we're looking apples and apples from one community to another. So first we look at Coaldale building permit data, and we look at it over a three-year period. Um, so what we can see here is that um, we provide values for residential, industrial, commercial, and institutional. I will note that in the building permit field, the gap between industrial and commercial is uh, strange and somewhat confusing. Um, so we like to look at industrial and commercial values sort of blended together. It makes far more sense that way. Uh, what you can see is that uh, we went from $10.8 million in 2020 uh, to 22 million in 2021 to 71 million in 2022, noting that the high school is built into the institutional value, which we did 42 million dollars worth of uh, institutional permits in 2022, uh, which is great because we get a percentage of the value of those permits, but it also uh, isn't as we shouldn't necessarily um, you know be too excited about 71 million dollars of investment because a lot of it is a one-time public investment. That being said, um, there are a lot of interesting things that come out of this, particularly as we've discussed, um, you know, these middle values, industrial, commercial, we go from approximately $2 million of investment in 2020, uh, looking at uh, closer to $11 million, uh, 11 to $12 million in 2021, and now upwards of $18 million in 2022. So a nice uptick of real construction that's happening in Coaldale that is going to support that non-residential tax base, which we all know is an important part of building a healthy financial position for the town. So this is reflective of what we knew was happening, but it's nice confirmation that the work that we've done from an economic development perspective has been working. Uh, as far as the residential values, this is very interesting. As we said, residential permit values are, are down, that the principal residential, uh, the residential, sorry, residential permit numbers are down. The principal, obviously, driver of residential permits is going to be uh, new housing construction. So while in 2022 we didn't do a lot of permits for new housing development, what we do see is a continued increase in the amount that people are investing into residential properties in the town. In fact, almost $11 million was invested in real construction work that happened in Coldale. So that tells us that while uh, we're not necessarily thrilled about the pace of new home development, Though again, we understand why that's the case. People are still valuing, they're, they're looking at their properties in Coldale and saying, this is worth investing in and maintaining over the long term. And that's where people are doing additions, they're doing renovations, they're building decks, they're doing all those other things that add value to their properties uh, to the tune of almost $11 million. Now we look at the comparative values. So looking at the comparative values alone for 2022, uh, here we blend commercial and industrial together. Uh, obviously, the $42 million of institutional value is, is significant. Um, what we see here is that Coaldale uh, outpaced Tabor uh, by approximately 20% in terms of residential investment. Um, so that's obviously a good number. And in fact, Black Falls, uh, while this value at 13.7 is significantly higher, when you consider that Black Falls at approximately 11,500 people is about 25% larger. On a per capita basis, we're basically tied uh, with Black Falls. And so Black Falls, over the past 10 years, has been one of the fastest growing municipalities uh, in Alberta. Uh, they have shot up dramatically uh, in population over that time. And so it tells us that looking at Tabor's numbers, uh, which is, is still a good number for Tabor, to be clear, um, our values in terms of what folks are investing in residential properties are remain solid. So that tells us that Coaldale is viewed as an attractive area that people want to invest in. So that's great. Uh, where we really shine here 
I'll just show the bar chart here, is in the commercial industrial number. So we show the orange uh, bar here. Uh, four times the rate of commercial and industrial investment in 2022 relative to Tabor, uh, and two and a half times that of Black Falls. Uh, $18.5 million is obviously tremendous, a tremendous value, and obviously it's hard to beat the institutional number, though I don't pat myself on the back too aggressively for that. <clears throat> Three-year average numbers uh, are what we look at here, and we really feel that three-year average values are important because any one year, so for example, you know, in the industrial park, one building might happen in one year that's, you know, it's obviously a tremendous investment, but if it can't be repeated, uh, it pr provides, paints less of a clear picture in terms of continued investment to the community. So we like to look at a three-year average. So looking at 2020, 2021, and 2022 numbers, what do we see again? Our residential investments over that period um, are approximately $2 million uh, per year higher than Tabor and approximately $3 million per year lower than Blackfold. So again, uh, on a comparative basis, that's still a very strong number. And again, while our 2022 numbers uh, were obviously extremely high, even blending that over a three-year period, we're still averaging almost $11 million of non-residential inv building investment in town over that period compared to six million in Tabor and three million in Black Falls. Um, Tabor and Black Falls are not doing poorly by this metric at all. And so that tells us that Coaldale is doing very, very well. We should be happy with that. And it tells us that the decision, uh, the decisions that we're making from a policy uh, perspective in terms of supporting our industrial developments, in terms of establishing uh, competitive tax rates and things like that are working. Um, and that people really do look at Coaldale as a place uh, to invest. Again, uh, less interested here. And in fact, Black Falls had a massive uh, public investment two years ago. Uh, so their number is even higher on a three-year average. But again, we're less concerned about that. Uh, we're looking at $20 million of residential and non-residential investment every year uh, on average over a three-year period. What's also interesting for us is that um, the value of our commercial and industrial permits over that three-year average has in fact exceeded our residential investment. So we went from a what might have been uh, $4 invested in a house, in every house, relative to $1 invested in, in business uh, in Coaldale uh, in previous years. And now we in fact have, uh, for every dollar, it's 45 cents into residential and 55 cents into commercial. So we've had, not only have we made up the gap in terms of attracting commercial investment, but now we're at a point where we're actually attracting dollars to dollars more non-residential investment than we are residential investment, which is wonderful. So we'd love for, we'd love for that to continue. I realize I spend a lot of time talking to council about statistics, and I apologize for that. I just think they're very important, and I think that they guide all of our work in terms of the decisions we make and understanding whether or not they're working and whether or not they're not, and uh, I'm very proud, and, and I think you should be too, of what we've seen at Coldale over the last few years. It's very important, and it Growth and investment is one of my favorite topics when you bring this to council. So thank you. Thank you very much. Well done. I'll open it up to council for any questions for Cameron. I think you explained it very well. Deputy Mayor Beekman. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just uh, in regards to the the increase in the commercial industrial, um, do you see that trajectory continuing? Um, thank you. Uh, so we're likely to be potentially limited in 2023, uh, just with the, the fact that approximately a year ago, we, we fundamentally sold out of the industrial land. We do have some commercial uh, commercial development that's gonna help with that. Um, but realistically, 2023 will probably be lower than 2022, but then once the new industrial park comes online, I'm, I'm hopeful that that's gonna bounce right back up. Awesome, thank you for the report. You're welcome. Anybody else, Councillor Chapman? Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Cam, for, uh, for these great uh, numbers and this your report. Uh, and it shows to, to me that, uh, you know, we, we are holding par uh, provincially and, and regionally, and I'm very proud of what we've accomplished in Coaldale um, the last number of years. Uh, outside of the institutional uh, spikes, uh, it, you know, I think uh, we're, we're doing well. And... I guess going back to your uh, previous page uh, with the Coaldale development permits uh, further up, um, and I'm pleased that you've, you've broken down new housing starts by subdivision, and um, I, I'm glad to see that you're also including infills. 
what I'd like to know uh, from these, from those uh, subdivisions is, would you be able to tell us or have a, a spreadsheet that would show, you know, how much of the development is 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 uh, filled? For example, Cottonwood Estates is at ninety percent, or are we at hundred uh, percent filled? Um, like park side acres, you've got two developments in there. Is that meaning that there's you know quite a few more still to go? Waterfront is it completely sold out? That sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I could do that as as part of a, a separate report. Um, so. The work that's done uh, on this spreadsheet, so not the building permit, I, I pull that from um, Superior Safety Codes provides me with an annual update there. Uh, this is work that's done uh, by Kylie, uh, who I'm thrilled to have back <laughs> following her leave because she does a tremendous job keeping on top of this um, and making sure that it's accurate and, and what have you. Um, and so she wouldn't necessarily, necessarily also have that information. I wouldn't, she's very, very busy. I wouldn't want to ask her no. to do that as well. Uh, but I could certainly do an analysis perhaps uh, at my next quarterly report. I was planning to look at uh, the development project or the, the, the broader uh, uh, projects, uh, you know, looking at our new infrastructure plans and things like that, providing an analysis of those so we could talk about what the inventories and existing uh, places are then. Just one further question, uh, say for example with Cottonwood Estates, any of the empty lots in there be considered infill? I'm going to say no, because um, I think infill would likely be, that infill would likely be tied to the issuance of a demolition permit. I think that's oh. what triggers in this. Okay, yeah. all right, thank you. Any other questions for Cameron? Seeing none, can I get someone to make a motion that council receive the 2022 building statistics report as information? Councillor Pickering, any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Carried unanimously. Thank you, Cameron. I'm done. <laughs> I believe you're done. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Moving on to agenda item 11.1 uh, under correspondence, uh, we have a letter from Municipal Affairs Minister Rebecca Schultz. Is there any questions, comments on that one that was regarding the budget? Could I get someone to make a motion that Council receive correspondence from Municipal Affairs as information? Councillor Chapman, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Under information items, uh, item 12.1, uh, Coldell Library, uh, March slash April newsletter and calendar. Myself and uh, Councillor Reese and Pickering uh, went to their open house on Saturday and it was well done, well attended. Uh, they did an excellent job on that. Any questions or any other comments on that one? Can I get someone to make a motion uh, to receive the Coldell Library newsletter and calendar as information? Deputy Mayor Beekman, all those in favor? Carried unanimously, thank you. And then we have a um, report from SEWA regarding uh, next steps, uh, or as a roadmap as they call it. Any questions, comments on that one? I'll move on that. Okay, Councilor Chapman makes uh, the motion that to receive SEWA's roadmap as information. Any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Carried unanimously, thank you. And the last one, we have the uh, pre-audit letter from Avail uh, CPA uh, regarding uh, our financial statements. Any questions, comments on that one? Just a quick question, Mayor. Uh, what was the cost for that audit? I asked that question of our CAO. It's approximately $21,000 per year. We put out an RFP, I believe, three years ago. It was for a five-year Period. So the average cost per year is in that neighborhood of low twenty thousand. Okay, thank you. I just thought I saw a way higher number that was in the in a in the report somewhere. It may have been our half a million our dollars. Line item. Our, what was it? it? May have been our assets. Line that item. was five hundred and no, almost half a million dollars. Yeah, that wasn't. And I thought. Really <laughs> 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 okay. Okay. While you're on the topic. Uh, Councilor Chapman, do you want to carry the sponsor the motion to receive the avail letter of engagement as information? Oh, thank you. 
Okay, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Carry unanimously. Thank you. And that concludes the open portion of the meeting. So I will require a motion from someone that council move into closed session at 6.49 p.m. in accordance with section 197-4-B of the Municipal Government Act to discuss matters exempt from disclosure for items 13.1, 13.2, subject to section 16, business interests of a third party, items 13.2, subject to section 17, personal privacy, section 25, economic and other interests of a public body, and section 27, privileged information. Uh, who would care to sponsor that motion? Councillor Saylor, all those in favor? Kerrigan asked me, thank you. We'll take a 10 minute